we open the day with an uh, outstanding keynote speaker, Mr. Rafael Del Pino, who will be speaking on the topic, the European business viewpoint. We regret you've seen in the programs that there, were, there was also Mr. Sanchez Lozano, Iberia's CEO, and he had to cancel his flight, so he's not here with us. And um, Mr. Del Pino will be presented by Jose Manuel Martinez Sierra, and it's my pleasure, pleasure to introduce uh, Jose Manuel, he's Jean Monet, professor for the study of Euro European Union law. It's a member of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies and the Center for European Studies. He's also, and mainly, uh, the director of the Real Colegio Complutense at Harvard, to, to whom we are extremely grateful for his generous contribution to this conference. And now I hand it over to you, Jose Manuel. Thank you. It's hard when you say generous because now in Spain we are taking care of uh, all the figures that we put in this. But definitely we are, we are happy to to support this event. As I said yesterday, by the way, I, I'm happy honored to be the the only one being introducing two panelists. And this is of course because the, the Spanish crisis. We are you know in a in a in an internal devaluation, so we have to work twice to get the same the same revenues that we got before. So this is the reason why I'm, I'm working twice and, and during the weekend. And so um, once I say that, uh, it's, it's an honor to introduce uh, Rafael Del Pino. And also I've been asked to make a brief, I mean, a brief uh, uh, link between yesterday's and today's section. And as you know, of course, uh, not unavoidably, the European crisis uh, is, has been uh, uh, actually the cornerstone of every reference during the day of yesterday. That, that, of course, makes sense. We are not avoiding the, the main topic. We have a process that is taking already more than 50 years, and it's been a dream. We have a, a Jew funding fathers, and, and a Jew we didn't have funding mothers. Eventually, they might be one of the structural problems that, that we do face when, when actually when facing the, both the political uh, uh, structure of European Union and also the economic governance. So there were basically two, to, to summarize it, two basically ideas. On the one hand, this is a political crisis. Basically, we, we, can, uh, we are not managing well to, where to place the decision-making process and the other way timing. And there are other visions and pretty related with the other one is that um, it's, a pro it's a problem of, of, of foreseen, which is the recipe. And when to combine the two basically uh, tools that it seems we have uh, within the EU, EU and the member states, so austerity combined with with incentive and, and growth. Uh, a really important part of that was the, which is a role that that, that businessmen, firms, and European uh, firms can play in, in this situation. And, and here the views that we are going to have today from Rafael Pino and the model of his uh, firm uh, will be really useful to to basically to to operate in this transatlantic dialogue in this global crisis. Um, um, Rafael Del Pino is both uh, uh, is pretty involved in, 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 in knowledge systems and at the same time in the, in the films. It will be like a combination of what we could call it the traditional European uh, uh, business leaders. So it's a well considered family, a businessman. It's a company that has more than a century, a half century. And at the same time, he just uh, jumped overseas and he's pretty pretty well connected and working in the, in the knowledge system. So, as you know, um, Forovial is, is present as a global company. It's a Spanish, European global company is present in, in, in Chile, Australia, Great Britain, United States, of course, in Spain. And, 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 and I would say that in every key field in infrastructure, they have a, a role to play. Uh, and of course, it's, it's a systemic uh, business, uh, business firm too. He, he took many positions. He's been doing a long career from bottom top. Uh, so, so he's been CEO and now he's president. And and but I would like to emphasize something that eventually is, is less emphasized and is not quite quite common in in, in the Spanish and, and some European leaders. Is I would say it's a, a pretty American for, for being an, an European business leader. So he is working in, in, in his firm and he, the foundation, the Rafael Del Pino Foundation, that depends pretty much on his firm. Is working in the in the knowledge system, so they are promoting and helping uh, Spanish talent to go abroad, 
and particularly to key institutions in the world, for sure. They, they are supporting a lot of students coming to Harvard, to MIT, to Stanford, and, and many leading institutions in the world. They are also, uh, he is pretty personally pretty involved in the European uh, board of this, this house of the business school. Uh, he is uh, actually uh, um, MBA even mid Sloan um, program, and he also pre involved in some boards there at MIT. So that will combine. Well, we will we will say the the, the, the dream the twin the dream uh, profile of, of a business both tradition. So no no surprises that many times we have many surprises in the in the in the in the business sector modern leadership and combining that with modernization. So uh, please uh, join me thanking uh, Rafael Lepino for being here today at Business School. Well, thank you, Jose Manuel. I, I'm sorry to disturb your sleep on Sunday morning, but I was I was only given this slot. And um, to just tell the, the Iberia CEO to fly through Heathrow next time, so he will uh, make the connection for sure. <laughs> Now, Ferrovial that just turned 60, um, 60 years old uh, last December, and um, I will tell you a little bit the history of the company, and then I will open for questions about uh, the European crisis or whatever you might think about. Although the speakers yesterday have a much bigger view of what's going on at the macro level, so I will stick to what I know. And um, so we tend. To, well, first of all, let me see. This one here, that's uh, the new, the terminal, last terminal building built at Barajas Airport that uh, we played a major role um, in building it. And um, uh, we, we tend to define ourselves as a leading global operator in infrastructure and cities. And um, the company started in, in Spain in 1952 uh, as a small builder of uh, railway sleepers. And uh, we evolved over time, as I will tell you, this is a building in Warsaw, in Poland. Um, so we, uh, we, we have sales of uh, 7 billion euro, a net income last year of uh, 700 million, and a BTA of, uh, is the building falling apart? <laughs> uh, an ABDA of 900 million and uh, a backlog between construction and services of 21 billion. This is all in Europe, uh, 25, uh, 21 billion euro, um, and uh, around 60,000 employees and a uh, market cap of uh, about 8 billion. And we are present in uh, more than 25 countries. Now we are involved in, in construction. Um, both uh, civil engineering and uh, building and industrial. Um, we have uh, combined eight years of experience because we bought an older and bigger competitor uh, in 95. Um, the second largest division is services, um, in, uh, which is a very wide definition. We do urban services, so uh, waste uh, collection and treatment, uh, urban cleaning, maintenance of all kinds of urban infrastructure including uh, parks, and um, we focus now on bigger contract on, on bigger cities, as I will tell later. And uh, toll roads is a very large uh, activity for us and important. It started in 1968 in Spain, and uh, we had our first international concession in 95 in uh, Colombia, and um, then went on to Chile, and then we developed um, uh, in North America rest of Europe and uh, we started the airport division in the late 90s with a very small airport in northern Chile and uh, have, uh, and now is one of the major activities that, uh, that we have. Now in terms of geography, um, in revenues Spain is about one third and then UK is just a bit bigger and the rest is almost evenly split between the US uh, and Canada and the uh, rest of the world. In the BDA, um, as you can see, uh, uh, the UK is the largest contributor, uh, followed by Spain, and then again uh, North America, and a little bit from the uh, rest of the world. And uh, by business area, the largest um, is uh, in terms of revenues is construction, 
and second largest is services, but uh, in ABDA, the split is uh, quite different with uh, uh, toll roads and um, airports having much larger contribu contribution than uh, the other divisions. And uh, obviously, we are concerned about being sustainable and cooperating with the communities in which we operate. And uh, we have been uh, for many years now in the FTSE for Good Index and in the uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Well, worldwide is a bit uh, ambitious as, an, as, a, as a term, but uh, we are, um, our main focus of activity, as I said before, is uh, Europe, North America, uh, with the US and Canada, and uh, Latin America, and within Europe, Spain, UK, and Poland. And the rest, some of them are just very small projects. Uh, we, we put a, a dot there. But most of the orange dots in exotic places are just a small water treatment or water desalination plants. Um, so they um, do a lot for the map, but they don't do a lot in terms of revenue and uh, net income. And uh, this, these are a few physical magnitudes. Um, right? So we maintain almost uh, 20,000 kilometers of roads. We've built also almost 20,000 kilometers of uh, roads for different customers. Maintain 1,400 hectares, uh, so that's about 10,000 acres of uh, parks and gardens. Uh, we're present in 130 major European cities. Um, in toll roads, we've managed a total investment of about 21 billion euro, with 2,000 kilometers uh, of uh, new road being built or upgraded in 24 different concessions. And uh, we now operate four airports. This, this number is diminishing thanks to the contribution of the UK Competition Commission. Um, it used to be seven and 120 million passengers. Now uh, we're downsizing, so we're down to four and 82 million. Um, but as you see, the number of flights is still very high. So of these 680,000, 480,000 a year operate out of Heathrow. So this is how we started. In fact, this picture is probably more in the 60s than the 50s, because the way Ferrovial started was uh, building wooden sleepers as, as you can see here they are they have concrete and steel so they are probably a bit um, uh, early 60s rather than, than 50s um, the first uh, railway full railway contract was in the mid 50s and in 58 we started doing some uh, hydraulic works and in the 60s we started with road construction and in 68 we got the first um, toll road in northern Spain. This is a picture of uh, a recent picture of the, of the bridge that was built probably in the, in the 1970s. And uh, we, we like to show this picture because it, it was an innovative construction method that helped us save money, which we still apply a lot today. That's what I call value engineering. So we engineer and design to make things easier to build and cheaper to build and try to maintain. So there was no space here to put two pillars. So we put one pillar and then open it, open it up, uh, making for it. That was the first time it was done in the world, and um, but it made for a much cheaper, and quicker construction method. Um, in the 70s, we started <coughs> with some real estate developments. We sold our housing business in December 2006. People say we were smart, we were lucky, and um, just before the crisis. In uh, 1974, we got our second total concession and then in 78 uh, we had a big hit from the uh, um, uh, oil crisis and we started um, doing work in Libya so this is the Libyan team uh, as you probably know uh, Spain was dominated by Arabs for seven centuries and it shows in the faces of the people so these that look like Bin Laden are actually Spanish people working there <coughs> and uh, I was myself working there for one year in 1982, right out of college. And uh, then in the 80s, um, we uh, started with uh, the high speed rail lines from Madrid to Seville. We acquired the water treatment business that we still own. And of course, we are starting in the late 80s to have uh, to enjoy the, um, the uh, upside of the uh, Olympics and the and Seville International. In um, 92, I was appointed CEO, January 92. We had a, a 
big bit of a hangover from uh, the uh, excesses of the uh, of the late eighties and beginning of the eighties. So it was a very a very tough year, and uh, we uh, decided to. So we had our first strategy meeting, and we decided to try to apply what we knew um, in other places, and uh, we uh, focused on Colombia and Chile in toll roads. Uh, we had a very successful business there. We pulled out of Colombia for safety reasons. The um, early 2000, and uh, we uh, we stayed in Chile for many years, which is actually there. Uh, in '95, we acquired a major competitor, that is the one that gave us the curriculum for 80 years or whatever it was. <clears throat> '96, we got the first concession after the Franco regime. Um, so Franco died in '78. Uh, sorry, in '75. So that was a Long period without toll roads in the domestic market. Um, Ninety-seven, we started to work with um, famous architects, and we started with the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao with Frank Gehry. And we did some other works with other famous uh, um, designers. And in '98, we got this uh, first airport concession I mentioned before. That is in northern Chile. It's a very. It was such a small airport. It has about 1.2 or 1.3 million passengers a year. I used to say, don't go and sit because the ticket will eat up most of the BTA. So you better stay home and do it by video conference or something. Um, but it gave us curriculum to go to other places. So uh, the, um, the Minister of Public Works at the time later became um, um, President of Chile. And once he left office, he asked me a question. It was funny because it was like 10 or 12 years after that. He said, Rafael, why did you bet for Antofagasta Airport? And I said, well, simply because nobody asked for any curriculum in that airport. So it was the only one we could bid with a big partnership with other people. And he gave us. Then after that, we, we, we became airport operators. And uh, in 1999, uh, we, we went public. We were still quoted in the Madrid Stock Exchange. And uh, we had a major um, success in getting the 407 ETR road, which you see in the picture in Toronto. That's a major project. Uh, it is a highway that goes around the road. It's a ring road. It's on, only half of the ring because the other half is the lake. Um, and uh, we uh, bought it from uh, the Ontario government and extended it from 60 to 100 kilometers, 120, so duplicated it. And it's been an incredibly successful road, a very advanced stalling systems, no barriers. So it's just told as you go around different countries, uh, very innovative. Then this um, last decade, uh, we uh, got into Poland. We acquired Budimex, which was the, one of the largest uh, construction companies in the country in 2000. Then we bought another one, we merged the two. Now we're the second largest, first or second largest builder in Poland. In 2003, we acquired um, two service companies, uh, Amy in the UK, that was in the brink of bankruptcy, and Tespa in Spain. Um, both been doing very well. Amy is now our main um, support in the services division um, and uh, uh, very successful turnaround story. And then through Amy, we got into tube lines, which was a contract to maintain um, three out of six London underground lines uh, that we're still doing today. So we're maintaining and upgrading half of the London underground. Then in 2004, we, uh, we started we had our first concession in the U.S. That was a privatization of uh, the bridge that you see there uh, that was owned by the city of Chicago. Financially, the project has not been bad, but it's not a huge success, but it gave us a foot in the U.S. Uh, in which we expanded later, later on. And then um, in 2006, we um, started activities in Texas, the acquisition of Weber, which is a very small contractor there, uh, but was the base to bid for the toll roads that you see in 2007, WNTE and LBJ in Dallas, and SH-130 uh, between Austin and San Antonio that has been opened um, uh, last year. And uh, we also bought Swissport as a services business that we sold later on, and BAA um, in 2006. And now in 2009, to make more efficient use of our resources, we merged uh, 
And these are two tunnel boring machines that are now digging under London. Um, and a, uh, a very big uh, rail link that crosses east to west under the city. And um, that um, um, we, we have been focusing a lot on the UK market from our base in Amy and, um, and uh, EAA. Uh, so we, we were building the new um, terminal at Heathrow that we will see um, finished by the end of uh, this year. Um, we have two very large contracts to service all the infrastructure in Birmingham and Sheffield, upgrading also lighting system and, and saving um, over 40% of the energy bill of the cities. And now we are, what you see on the right is the expansion in the US in the last few years. Um, so 407 BTR East extension, that's an extension to the east of the toll road in Toronto. Uh, US Route 460, that's a new project in Virginia that was uh, awarded just uh, a few months ago. And the extension was signed on Friday, so this is very recent information. And uh, there, all of them are um, anything between 600 and 1.3 billion dollars. So it's important job for us, and we're very happy with the way we are progressing in the U.S. and Canada. And um, this is our vision. It's always difficult to write the vision. Um, I think it's easier to execute it than to summarize it. But this is how we. Um, ourselves and um, I think the, the middle line or the middle paragraph is the one that is most important for us we focus on operational excellence and uh, applying innovative engineering solutions to solve our customers uh, problems efficiently and this is the last picture that's the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao that we built in the late 90s and um, we'll answer questions thank you Um, <clears throat> Rafael, many of the things that uh, been going on in Spain and in Europe is precisely about with the model of, of, of a firm and businessmen. Uh, if we see what you've been presenting here, it's absolutely it's, it's a long tradition. It's a lot of years working to get the position. So we will say, like in the saying, slowly, slowly you catch the monkey. There have been many other firms that try to grow too fast and got eventually too much benefit in short time, and eventually those weren't really useful when the crisis came. So what would be your vision, and if you could bring here to the students that what you will say that friends would have to be reliable, and, and, and what, what will be like the, the, the key elements that you will give to your board of trustees when, when facing projects? Well, we will make, make mistakes, so uh, the question is whether that mistake uh, cost you your life or not, I think. And, uh, if you look at the history of the firm, we've had successes and mistakes. Uh, fortunately, the successes have been uh, bigger um, than, the, than the mistakes, but I think you have to focus on the basics. Always the uh, main constraint for growth, mm -hmm. and the main asset, uh, you see it on, also on the, on the reverse side, is the quality of your human resources. So if you have a good team, uh, you do well. If you don't have a good team, you do wrong. Um, the crisis, I think, and that could be probably applied to the countries in Europe. Uh, what you have, what I learned from the crisis, is that that you have to be more decisive and quicker uh, to, be, to, to be in front of the wave. So when we saw the uh, uh, crisis looming in 2007, we were a bit slow to react. But then when um, and we knew it, something was coming. We never thought it was that deep or that long. You could see already something coming. And in 2008, with the Lehman collapse, uh, we we set up a uh, what I call the survival mode. So we said, oh, the important thing here now is to survive and go through this crisis, whatever happens. And uh, we did major surgery. I mean, we we cut off some fingers and maybe one arm. And uh, <coughs> so we sold. Uh, we we set up a big divestment program, and we went from a net debt at the parent company of about three and a half billion euro in uh, 2007 or 2008 to a net cash of one and a half billion euro 
uh, at the end of last year. So that, that's, uh, I think that's a major change in, in attitude. So back to basics was to survive and uh, focus on cash generation and um, unlimited terms. Uh, but um, I think, uh, I think you have, what, what did we do wrong? Maybe we took a bit long to react, much, much, much less than other competitors. And maybe the action was not as decisive as we should have done. So if, we, if that happened again, uh, we'll do it uh, quicker and deeper um, next time. So we're OK, but we would be worth a bit more if we had acted earlier. I'm on the, the top five question of this conference eventually will be the way out of the crisis, of course. And, and of course, two positions, there's like a general concern among the panelists that uh, internal devaluation was, was needed. <clears throat> internal devaluation was needed. And it was the only way, since we just have a single currency, but not fiscal uh, tools in the European Union level. But this is, uh, it's been really painful already. There was a quote that Greece dropped its GDP 15% and the efforts that other countries are doing. And there's like a sort of general concession that there's been a lot of work and efforts for all those countries that were in, in trouble. And this also seems that it's been already a, a, a general consensus, or at least bigger than it was before, that incentive and growth is, is already needed and we should make sure. Which is your position in this 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 debate? Well, I, I, as I said at the beginning, uh, we uh, we adapt to what the politicians do rather than um, try to think of what they should be doing. So we tell them what we think uh, they should be doing, but uh, we tell them quietly, never in public, and, uh, <laughs> and we 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 adapt to the environment. So um, in terms of the evaluation, it doesn't affect us a lot because most of our costs are local. So if we come here to the U.S., maybe 98% of the cost is U.S.-based, um, and, uh, and maybe 99. I don't know, but, but a huge, a huge percentage. And uh, what we try is to be more efficient at our competitors and more imaginative. So the first large road that we, uh, <coughs> the second road of the largest contract we got in, in Texas. Of the LPJ in Dallas, and that's almost a two billion dollar investment. Uh, we just proposed the solution to cross uh, under different interchanges with the, the extension of the road that was much cheaper to build and much cheaper to maintain than the one that had been devised by the engineers contracted by the uh, Texas Department of Transportation. Um, and uh, we've been doing that for many years because when we design, we know how much things cost or how difficult they are to make, while the guy who just has the design is selling paper and he's not as incentivized as we are to be efficient. So that's, uh, and, and that's what, we're, what we're doing um, wherever we go. Um, so do we need an evaluation? I say, well, it, it would be good, but for us it's not relevant. Uh, now the country needs an evaluation, uh, probably yes, but uh, it doesn't look like what we need, I think, is a relative evaluation against Germany. Uh, so that's either we reduce our, um, our um, salaries or the Germans have a high inflation. Uh, it is the, the relative price structure that doesn't work. Uh, and maybe a, a more um, or a deeper labor reform will help also with that. Um, and the second, the second question was? Well, it was. Uh, what, what will be the the, the, the recipe the, for um, sort of the what? or some? Well, one major, one major cons if, if, I, if I knew it, I would apply it. And, uh -huh. uh, I haven't done it so far. So, um, I, uh, my, my my concern has been that um, if you go to you look at uh, southern Europe, mostly Italy and Spain, most of the budget reduction has become from. Uh, reduced government investment, not reduced current spending. <clears throat> so uh, I haven't given you the figures because the top line is almost flat, but the truth is that in 2006, we had sales in domestic construction. So the four divisions that you saw that construction in Spain was 3.6 billion euro. And in 2013, we'd be lucky if it's about a thousand. Uh, and that's 
must be related to the size of the market. So market, our market share has slightly increased in the crisis, but not much. So it's, uh, it gives you an idea of uh, this is both public and, and private, but it's quite correlated. So you can see where the cuts came from. Um, there is um, one data that was given by a Spanish politician that I said now that say that the region of Andalusia has more official cars than the whole of the UK. So the, the good thing is that there's hope. <laughs> so if, if there's so much money not wisely spent, there's, there's a, a lot that can be done. Or to say, another, to put another example, in Sheffield, in the big contract that Amy got with the city of Sheffield, we guaranteed the city roughly 20% <coughs> savings on their services bill. If they contracted all the services together. And then we have, a, I think, profit sharing uh, if we do more than that. Now we have proposed that to Madrid, and it hasn't happened yet. So we can, we can save 20% of the Madrid budget if they consolidate the services that they've done in other places. Maintaining the same level of service, then you have also additional reductions if instead of uh, collecting the waste every day, you collect it every other day or three times a week. So, uh, so there are many things that can be done in current spending um, that, that's not without affecting the, the, the level of services. And, and number two is we have to kickstart domestic consumption. So domestic consumption is still going down. And uh, you can see it in every figure. So uh, fuel consumption, electricity, <coughs> electricity consumption, retail sales, traffic in our toll roads, tons of waste that we're processing. Uh, in the different places, and uh, that's a big concern. So, uh, and, and, and the only way to get out of here, I think, and to improve, and to improve our employment, uh, which is a big social concern in addition to that, is to kickstart uh, consumption. We are going to open the floor, if you feel like it, then we will do it. Of course, uh, following uh, the rules of the house, so, so just feel free to go to the microphones that we have in both uh, corridors, and, and, a, and a question mark will be appreciated. So if you feel like it, you have a microphone right over there, I think. So, oh, no, no microphone? OK. So you might jump to the other one. In the meantime, uh, while we are finding the, you have a question. So you call, you may get the the microphone already, if you feel like it. Yeah, get the microphone, perfect. It works, go ahead. I'm John Kaiser, I'm a member of the faculty of the Kennedy School. Uh, you made a short reference to labor market reform. And looking at, now uh, this is a question related to Spain, to Spain which is 30% of your business. And looking uh, at Spain from outside, and you also mentioned the question of competitiveness, taking Germany as the benchmark. Um, labor market reform is central. One is very much struck by the bifurcation into two parts, a privileged part and an underprivileged part. And uh, I asked yesterday, the, uh, privately, your minister, and he said, no, no, labor market reform is beginning. And I was just wondering, uh, what is your point of view as a businessman? Uh, what has happened? And what remains to be done to overcome the, uh, the bifurcation into two markets? Perhaps to something what uh, happened under the Schroeder government in Germany, uh, as far as labor market reform is concerned. When you mentioned the, 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 the two markets, you don't have a fixed contract and they don't have a temporary contract? Well, I think there are three parts there. Those who have a fixed contract, those who have a temporary contract, and those who do not work. And the big gap is between those who work and those who do not work. Uh, so those who work are probably better off today than they were three years ago. They have lower interest rates. They are paying less um, mortgage, a, a lower mortgage as a consequence of that. Uh, taxes have been raised a bit, but not much. Um, so maybe they have more disposable, and, and their income has raised a little bit more than inflation. So they probably have at least the same disposable income that they had a few years ago. Um, now the big problem is that 25% of us work. Uh, and they, um, I 
do not think the figure is as high at that number uh, when we were, because people are gaming the system, and when we were at full employment, and full employment meant that we couldn't fly any, we couldn't find any labor to work in our projects in 2005 or 2006. The unemployment figure was close to six percent. So I don't know if this 25 or 26, how much is is it 20, is it 21? But it could be close to that figure. So people keep gaming the system, uh, but it's still very high. Uh, now, what, what do we need to improve on that? Um, I think is uh, uh, number one, maybe not that much austerity that quick, and uh, so that's the main the main concern. That's destroying uh, a huge amount of jobs. Uh, as, uh, we, we came up with the numbers um, with our Minister of Public Works when they announced the first cuts three years ago. I came back to him and said, listen, Minister, we've done a rough number. I think you're going to reduce employment by 150,000 to 200,000 people in a 45 million people country uh, um, just, just by these cuts, so uh, just, just your action. And they said, well, that figure is exaggerated. Well, it wasn't. It was a quite close figure. So, so I think uh, maybe less austerity. And there, in general, uh, the labor reform has been done in the right direction. So it, it is the first time it happens in 20 years. So it's a very encouraging sign. Maybe a bit, a bit deeper to increase uh, flexibility uh, in the labor force. So flexibility is a huge, uh, a huge advantage. And we see it here in the US. So almost any market where we go, the labor, the, the, the laws are, are or allow for higher flexibility than, than they do in Spain. Yes. Thank you, um, Marcello Palazzi. I'm a fellow here in our Iranian Foundation in Rotterdam to promote public-private partnership and entrepreneurship. And uh, your foundation in Spain has been engaged in developing entrepreneurship. Uh, I wonder what experience you've had and what the next steps might be. Well, it is not exactly my foundation. It has the same name, but it's my father's name. <laughs> so just to make sure that, um, and I have a son who has the same name. I made the same mistake. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, the, uh, so it was set up by him, uh, and it is run by my sister and, and, and the, her team over there. So I'm not. Uh, I'm a member of the board of trustees, but I'm not on the day-to-day -day business. But basically, we do two things. One is uh, we provide scholarships for students, for graduate students outside of Spain. So they're mostly Spanish students that come to the U.S. But some of the places we went, we, 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 have, we had a few at Harvard. I don't know whether there's anyone sitting here. Um, and uh, we also have a cycle of conferences that tend to uh, foster uh, the, let's say, private market or liberal uh, approach to the economy. Uh, these are the two main activities of the, uh, of the uh, foundation. Um, then we have another um, activity trying to educate the educators. So uh, trying to, um, we, we also provide scholarships and conferences and opportunities for uh, professional development for uh, uh, Spanish uh, university professors and, and some politicians. I don't know if you've, you have some of your grantees here, but I know you have some candidates for next year, just that you are aware of. You have some candidates because <laughs> for next year. So please go ahead. <laughs> with the federal government, but you did mostly with the state government. So 
Um, you, you know much more than I do about that. So I think you can consider that there are many different states. And some are more business friendly, others are less business friendly. More, some are more unionized, others less unionized. Some have stronger competitors, others haven't, because most, um, most of your competitors in the state are a state companies, so are, are focused on one or just a few states. There are very few national companies. Uh, and the question, I think, is what skills do you have that are different to other companies that can make you succeed? I think that's the question you should ask. Compared to the European uh, governments, any differences, any similarities? Uh, we feel very much at home in the US. Is that an answer? <laughs> 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 you can read between the lines. <laughs> in, in relation with that, and, and, and taking advantage of the situation, and I don't see any, any hand. If I see any hand, I will give the floor. If not, yesterday, the commissioner, uh, European commissioner for, for trade, pretty much advocated in the EU agenda, the transatlantic free area is, is a priority. There were some that argue it is for the European Commission and the member states, or yes, for the European Commission. So from, from your the business perspective, is, is this uh, a desirable future, and how do you see that? Is, is it going to happen in the second Obama administration? Well, the big concern, I think, um, would be if, uh, if uh, any um, the U.S. Or, or the European Union or some uh, European Union members become more protectionist. I think that's a big concern. And in terms of crisis, it is very easy to go to your voters and say all of our problems come from abroad. Uh, while are we buying Chinese goods instead of buying Spanish goods or U.S. goods instead of uh, European or whatever? So I think that's a, that's a major concern. So far, it hasn't happened. Um, or it, if it has happened, it has happened. In, in at, at the minor level, and we uh, uh, we've had some um, some modifications in the in the laws in Texas, uh, limiting the, the change of engineering firms midway through the process. Um, I, and that's obviously that was a lobby from the local companies. So has that have a big effect on our activities? No, it's better if it hasn't been passed, but it hasn't had a big effect. So I would say that I, I, my concern would be that uh, we go backwards. Now, if we do that, it would be even better. I think uh, it, it makes sense. And uh, there are things uh, that are surprising, like uh, the, um, the, the, the limitation for European airlines to compete on U.S. soil or U.S. air, and, uh, and also, and it, which is not reciprocated that way around. So that there's something that could be done obviously to improve that, and I think it would be positive on both sides. Uh, but um, as I say, I, I, I have enough. It is things that go backward in the crisis, and, and protection is, is not, um, uh, disappears as a, as a potential threat in the horizon. Thank you so much. So we, we, are, we are right on, on, on time, and, and just to show of the Spanish efficiency, we, we on time thank, thank Rafael Del Pino for being here. Thank you so much. Sure.